Welcome everyone to our fourth and final episode in this text and story series for Black History Month. I'm Gail, Minister at Zion Baptist Church in Cambridge, and the fourth and final figure we're looking at today is Peter Stanford. Peter Thomas Stanford was born in approximately 1860. In 1865, at the end of the American Civil War, which ended slavery, Peter Stanford found himself orphaned. He was taken in by Native Americans who taught him their language before passing him on to a Quaker group that took him to an orphanage in Boston. He was eventually adopted by a white couple called Mr. and Mrs. Stanford. He ran away from his adopted parents because he felt mistreated by them. He ended up living on the streets with a children's gang in New York. He converted to the Christian faith at a rally and came to the attention of some Christians who had been working for the abolition of slavery. With their help, he was able to complete studies and be ordained as a Baptist minister in 1878 in Connecticut. In 1882, Peter went to Canada and was briefly pastor of two churches there. He arrived in Liverpool, England in 1883 to try and raise funds for a church back in Canada. He then moved on to London and then Bradford and Keighley, Yorkshire. He settled in Birmingham, England in 1887, marrying an Englishwoman in 1888. And in 1889, he became minister of Hope Street Baptist Church in Birmingham. In 1890s Birmingham, there was great interest in campaigning against the lynchings of black people that were happening in America. In 1894, Stanford was asked via a public meeting to go to America as representative of Birmingham to report on these lynchings. Stanford duly went to Boston in 1895 and discovered the scale and nature of the lynchings taking place were far worse than the reports he'd heard when back in Birmingham. Stanford published his findings in his book, The Tragedy of the Negro in America in 1897. Whilst researching lynchings in the USA, Stanford organised an interdenominational ministers association in Boston and after briefly ministering in a church in New York, he settled in Massachusetts and founded the Union Industrial and Strangers Home for Homeless Women and Children. He died on the 20th of May 1909 in the USA. So what is the relevance of Peter Stanford's story for today? While the words he used back then to critique the church of his day perhaps serve as a timely warning to the church today about the dangers of being slow to hear and respond to the cries of those suffering inequality and injustice. A quote from his writing, The Tragedy of the Negro in America. Tens of thousands of pious men and women believe they do the will of the Almighty, who to them is our Father. Yet parsons and saints are practically dumb in respect of this gigantic outrage and devilish wickedness. Some, who are only a few when compared with the millions of American Christians, protest most earnestly. But let the citizens of the proud United States remember that murders are committed openly in their towns and cities, and they are guilty of a shameful silence in respect of them. As we hear those words, we also recognise that Stanford understood the importance of thinking and acting, not just locally, but globally. As I quote from him again, First, we suggest that Christian people are using every opportunity of creating a Christian public opinion on this Negro question. Let not anything that the opinion of England, France, Germany and other Euro European countries counts for nothing in the United States. Americans are proud of their country and boast of its liberty and equality and are quick to feel the touch of foreign reproach. His words, whilst using the language of his day, seem every bit as relevant today. In the light of struggles against the misuse of police powers, first highlighted in USA with the death of George Floyd, and now with the killing of protesters in Lagos, Nigeria. How might we be inspired by Peter Stanford's story to shine a light on things like disproportionate rates of incarceration and deaths in police custody of black people in Britain today? As we come to the end of our series, what will you do? How will you respond? 
But Jolla Agbebi's refusal to give up his African culture and insistence that it had value and should be respected. Nanny Helen Burroughs, entrepreneurial skills, starting a school for black girls and women. Sam Sharp's strategic thinking and action as he mobilized and sought to liberate enslaved black people. And Peter Stamper's commitment to helping those in need, not just locally, but globally. What will they inspire you, us, to do where you, we are today? I utter these words from Cambridge. From Castle Hill, we have a view across Cambridge. Across the road from my church, Parker's Peace, a world famous site, a site of many protests across the centuries. As I speak now, there's a protest taking place. Parker's Peace, across the road from my church here in Cambridge, where there will be cries of Black Lives Matter and cries of end SARS. What will our response be?